you can see. Well, you can give him this time if you want to see it, you will see it all. Hmm? Okay, if you want to. Appearances. This case is set for ruling, for, for, for judgment, and the judgment is ready. Judgment. by an information dated and filed on the first day of July 2021. The accused person is charged on a single count of murder contrary to section 187 of the criminal code, Cap 10, Volume 3, Laws of the Gambia. The particulars of offense alleged is that Yankuba Ture, sometime in the month of June 1995 at Kololi in the West Coast region of the Gambia, within the jurisdiction of this honorable court and with malice aforethought caused the death of one Usman Koro Sisi by beating him with a pistol like and other dangerous weapons thereby committing an offence. On the 8th day of July 2019, the accused person was arranged before this honorable court and he pleaded constitutional immunity to the single, count, to the single charge of murder levelled against him and this Honorable Court entered a plea of not guilty. To discharge the burden of proof required in this case, the prosecution called nine witnesses and tendered the following documents into evidence as prosecution exhibits. Namely, one, Exhibit A, voluntary statement of Yanku Bature, B, exhibit, exhibit B, cautionary statement of Yanku Bature, Exhibit P3, a post-mortem report, photocopy, and the Exhibit P3A, a post-mortem report original copy. During the course of the prosecution's case, the defense counsel tendered the following documents into evidence as defense exhibit, namely, one, Exhibit D1, the witness statement of Ensa Mendy, PW2, dated the second day of July 2019. Exhibit P D2, witness statement of Ensa Mendy, PW2, dated the fifth day of July 2019. Exhibit D3 is the official manuscript of Ensar Mendy, PW2, at the Truth, Reconciliation and Reparations Commission, TRRC, 
dated the 28th day of March 2019. Exhibit D4, witness statement of Pa Abib Mbai, PW5, dated the 11th day of October 2019. Exhibit D5, a certified copy of the record of proceedings in a case number HC-184-19-CR-025-2019-2020. Between the state and the Yankuba Ture and Fatumata Jahumpa Sisi. Six, Exhibit D6 certified true copy of the witness statement of Alaji Kanye PW6 dated the seventh day of March 2019. And Exhibit D8 is the official manuscript of Alaji Kanye PW6 at the TRRC dated the 28th day of February 2019. The following Following the closure of the prosecution's case, the defense entered a no-case submission, and it was hard and determined. This honorable court, on the 10th day of June 2019, dismissed the no-case submission and called upon the accused person to enter his defense. Consequently, the accused person opened his defense and called two witnesses, namely our Minte as DW1 and Mami Minte as DW2, respectively. After the conclusion of the testimonies of the two defense witnesses, the accused person thereafter testified as DW3. During the course of his testimony, the defense counsel on the 12th day of October 2020 made an oral application for this honorable court to discharge the accused person on the ground that the accused as a junta or council member of the Armed Forces Provisional Ruling Council, AFPRC, from the period of 1994 to 1997, and pass one to paragraph 13, 1, 3, 4, and 5 of the second schedule of the 1997 Constitution of the Gambia. The accused person enjoys immunity from pro such prosecution. Following the said application, this honorable court on the second day of November 2020, pass one to section 127, subsection 1 of the said Constitution, refer to the Supreme Court of the Gambia the following question for its determination whether the accused person is entitled to constitutional immunity from prosecution of the murder of Usman Koro Sisi, pursuant to paragraph 13, 1, 3, 4, and 5 of the second schedule of the Constitution of the Republic of the Gambia, 1997. On the 27th day of January 2021, the Supreme Court of the Gambia ruled that the accused person is not entitled to constitutional immunity from prosecution of the alleged murder of Usman Koro Sisi. Pass one to section, pass one to paragraph 13, 1, 3, 4, and 5 of the second schedule of the 1997 Constitution of the Gambia. The Supreme Court accordingly directed this honorable court to proceed with the trial of the accused person as charged. After the ruling of the Supreme Court, the accused person continued giving evidence and thereafter closed its defense. Summary of the prosecution evidence. PW1 sworn on the Holy Quran in English language and testified that his names are Bubakar Jamanka, a police officer attached to the crime investigation department. He recognized the accused person in the dock and testified that on the 28th day of June 2019, he was instructed by his divisional crime officer to join his colleagues at Kairaba police station, where a panel was set up. It is his testimony that upon joining his colleagues, they went to the anti-crime unit where they found the accused person and obtained cautionary and voluntary statements from him. He testified that before obtaining the cautionary and voluntary statements, he read the cautionary warnings and the particulars of the offense to the accused person. And his response was that he was invoking his constitutional immunity. And did not give any statement to that effect, and he also refused to sign the said cautionary and voluntary statements. The voluntary statements was admitted into evidence and marked as Exhibit A, and the cautionary statement was also admitted into evidence and marked as Exhibit B, respectively. On the cross-examination, he maintained that he was part of an investigation team and stated that he advised the accused person that he has the right to call his lawyer. And in fact, one of his officers called Yorosedi called the accused person's lawyer, but he could not pick the, he did not pick the call, phone. Pick the, not, pick, he did not pick the phone. He denied that he violated the accused person's right when he was obtaining the statement from him. PW2 sworn on the Holy Quran in English language and testified that his names are Esa Mendy from Brikama town 
and was enlisted in the Gambian National Army on the seventh day of May 1990 and left in 2001. He recognized the accused person in the dock and testified that he was the accused person's personal bodyguard and oddly from, the, from August 1994 to 2001. It is his testimony that in June 1995, the accused person was the Minister for Local Government and Lands. On the 23rd day of June 20, 20, 1995, he went to work with the accused person, where the accused informed him that the chairman of the AFPRC and the head of state will be traveling to, to Ethiopia in the evening, and they went you know, to the accused person's home and had lunch. After lunch, they later went back to the state house where council members went in for a meeting with the chairman, which lasted for almost an hour. He testified that when the accused came out of the meeting, it was time to depart from, for, to the airport. And the accused person asked him and the driver, Lamin Dur, PW4, to go back home and that he will join another council member's vehicle. He testified that. He went, they went home, and that was around 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. It is his testimony that whilst at home, he received a call from the accused person informing him that he should go on patrol with the home guards around BB Hotel area, near the beach, as there was a threat in that area. He testified that he went with some of the guards, but could not remember their names because they usually change home guards every week. However, he remembers the name, he remembers the guard commander, Corporal Jankom, now a captain in the army, and one private lamb in Bojang. He testified that as ordered, they went you know, on patrol, but they did not see anything, and they called the accused persons, but the accused told them to continue the patrol until he gave orders for them to, ret for them to return to the residence. He testified that as they were on the beach patrolling, the accused called them to return to the residence, and upon his return home at late night, between 1 a.m. to 2 a.m., he saw the accused in the sitting room going inside the bedroom and uh, closed the door. He testified that from, he, from his door, he could see that the floor of the house was wet with water and muddy, and he proceeded to the sitting room, and it was all muddy. He further testified that he saw the accused's uniform, a green fatigue placed on the ground, and was burnt around the side pocket. He said to himself that something must have happened here, and he went to bed. He testified that the following day, they went to work and had rumor, for, rumor that the Minister of Finance, Usman Korosise, has been killed, and some saying he was killed at the residence of the accused person. He testified that he was not part of it, it was not part of his duty as a bodyguard to the accused to be deployed for patrol at the beach side or any other place. And uh, after his patrol, he, nev he was never asked or instructed to go on patrol or by the accused person during the period he served as a bodyguard to the accused person. On the cross-examination, he maintained that he was an oddly and bodyguard to the accused person and he was giving an arm to protect him. His witness statement of the 2nd of July 2019 and 5th of July 2019 were admitted into evidence and marked as defense exhibit D1 and D2 respectively. He denied that he was instructed by the accused to leave State House between 9 to 10 p.m. and could not say that the accused killed the deceased. He further maintained that when he received a call from the accused, he informed the guard commander, Corporal Jankom, that there is a threat around BB Hotel area, and they went on patrol. But they left before Corporal Jankom, and during the patrol, he did not see or communicated to Jankom. He admitted of having an analog Nokia mobile phone from Gamtel, and he used to communicate with others. The manuscript of his testimony before the TRRC was admitted into evidence and marked as Defense Exhibit D3, and denied that his testimony in court and at the TRRC are different. He maintained that the living room was wet and muddy. PW3 sworn on the Holy Quran in English language and testified that his names are, his names are Hamad Jankom, a military officer with a rank of major. He recognized the accused person in the dock as a former member of the military junta 
and used to go on guard duties at his residence. It is his testimony that in June 1995, whilst on duties at the residence of the accused person as guard commander, the former chairman of the AFPRC, Captain Yaya AJJ Jamme, was traveling at night. He testified that he was at his guard post and the wife of the accused called Mami Minty called and told him that told him that told him to answer to a phone call that the accused wanted to talk to him. He then then he went you know, to the sitting room where the landline was and received the call and it was the accused who was on the line. He testified that the accused said to him that there is a birthday party at Edward Singata's residence and that he is sending a vehicle and should take all his family members to Edward Singata's residence and dropping and drop the family. Upon dropping the family, he should go on patrol with his men on the beach because they have got information that there is a boat coming with arms and ammunition. He testified that after dropping the accused person's family at the residence of Edward Singate, he went back home and picked his guards and uh, went on patrol on the beach near BB Hotel as ordered. He testified that they patrolled the beach for a long time and it started raining and he told his men to go back home. He testified that when they went back to the residence of the accused, they saw vehicles parked outside the residence and they entered inside and there and before he reached the guard room, he saw Edward Singate standing in a military uniform and they exchanged greetings and he ordered them to go to return back and continue their patrol. He testified that they returned back and continued their patrol until very late at night and they returned home to the residence of the accused and the vehicles were no longer parked there. He testified that he knows that Kosman Korosise is dead and it was the, the wife of it was the accused wife, Mami Minte, who showed him a newspaper where it is stated that Usman Koro Sise died in a car accident. He testified that he later heard from Freedom, Freedom Radio from Ibu Jalo, the former AFPRC spokesperson, that Usman Koro Sise was killed in the accused person's house and that the resident guards were fooled. On the cross-examination, he stated, he stated that he that him and Lamindur WO2 were in the vehicle of the accused fam were in the vehicle that the accused family they were in the vehicle that the accused family and took the accused family to Edward Singata's residence. He remembered going on patrol with Lamin Bojan but could not remember Ensa Mendy and other guards. He denied that Lamin Bojan went on patrol with Ensa Mendy. He maintained that he saw he saw Edward Singate at the residence of the accused person standing outside smoking. He was traveling outside the country. PW4 sworn on the Holy Quran in Mandinka language and testified to the effect that his names are Lamin Dur, a member of the Gambia Armed Forces. And in the year 1995, he was the driver of the he was the official driver of the accused person. He testified that he knew the disease as a former minister in 1995. He testified that the disease died in 1995. It is his testimony that he left the state house with Ensa Mendy, the oddly to the accused person, and went to the accused residence and met the guard commander called Jangom, PW3. He testified that upon arrival at the accused residence, Hamad Jangom informed him that the accused person has instructed that they should take his family to Edward Singata's residence, which they did, and later drove Ahmad Jangom to the to beach for patrol. He testified that when he returned from beach patrol, he found vehicles parked at the residence of the accused, and he then went out to see his friends. He testified that upon his return to the residence, he did not find those vehicles, those cars there again, and uh, went inside the house and did not find anybody, and the house was messy with bad odor. He testified that the following day, he heard on the radio that Koro Sise died in a car accident and later had rumors that the junta had knowledge about Koro's death. On the cross-examination, he admitted that he was residing at the accused person's residence together with Esa Mendy and Jali Musa Song. He stated that when he returned to the residence, he did not find anybody at the guard post and did not see anyone in the house. He, found, he further stated that he brought back the family to the accused resident and the smell of the house was not welcoming. 
PW5 sworn on the Holy Quran in English language and testified that his names are Pa Abib Mbai from 128 Mosque Road, Serakunda, and a retired police officer. He recognized the accused passing in the dock and knows the disease Usman Koro Sisi, and that he died in June 1995. It is his testimony that as of June 1995, he was the crime management coordinator, CMC of the Gambia Police Force. He testified that sometime in June 1995, at around 1 a.m., whilst in bed, he received a call from one Mr. Chan from Sukuta, who told him that a black Mercedes Benz, those allocated to the ministers, passed him, followed by a Land Rover that looks like Edward Singhata's La Land Rover. And that he did not know what these vehicles were doing at, at that night. And uh, that is why he called him. He testified that the following morning he went to, the, he went to work and there was information going viral that the finance minister now disease was killed. He testified that there was also information that the said finance minister was involved in an accident. It is his testimony that as the crime management coordinator, it was his duty to lead in any investigation of serious or major crime. And he began his investigation going to the airport and later went to the alleged scene alleged accident scene where he found the diseased car was burnt and the inside of the car was almost you know ashes he testified that he observed the rare number plate of the diseased car and it was detached and he went around the vehicle and observed that the vehicle was also was also attached to a bridge slab edge and there was little dent on the vehicle he testified that there was no remarkable dent on the car and he left the alleged accident scene and went to his office. He testified that he was at the post-mortem of the disease at the mortuary, where he found Peter Singate and observed that his right hand was bandaged. He testified that he said in loud voice that what happened to Usman Koro Sisi was a foul play. And upon his return to his office, the inspector general of police called and told him to answer to the accused person at his office. He testified that after some weeks, he was told that his service was no longer needed and that he should go home. A few weeks later, whilst at home, he received a dismissal letter which states that it was an executive directive that his service was terminated from the Gambia police force. A copy of the post-mortem report was admitted through him and marked as Prosecution Exhibit P3. On the cross-examination, his witness statement was admitted into evidence and marked as Defense Exhibit D4. He maintained that his evidence in chief, he maintained that his evidence in chief and his witness statement are consistent. On the re-examination, he maintained that he normally briefed the IGP when investigations are closed. PW6 sworn on the Holy Quran in English language and testified that his names are Alaji Kanye a former member of the Gambia Armed Forces. He recognized the accused passing in the army as AFPRC council member and also known, and also known the disease Usman Koro Sisi as the former minister of finance in the year 1995 when he died. He testified that sometime in June 1995, they, BK Jata, Tumbul Tamba, Pa Aliu Gomez, were taken to the residence of Edward Singate at Cape Point, Bacao. He testified that he, together with Edward Singate and Peter Singate, and all of them joined various cars and drove to the house of the accused passing at Kersering. It is his testimony that upon arrival at the house of the accused passing, they met the accused passing and none of the accused, fami none of the accused passing's family and home guards were at the house. He testified that they entered inside the house of the accused and they were briefed by Edward Singata that they were going to get rid of one minister called Usman Koro Sisi, the disease. He testified that Edward Singate told him that the disease did not know him and uh, asked him to wait at the gate to receive them and the disease. He further testified that Edward Singate and the other, and others left for the airport to see of the president. He testified that upon their return from the airport, Peter Singate was the first person to reach the house of the accused person. And Edward Singate arrived with the disease and then Edward Singate signaled to him that the disease was the minister. Alad Kanye further testified that he saluted the disease and led him into the house of the accused person. 
according to Alaji Kanye, as he entered the house of the accused person with the disease, he had a sound of a noise hit from the back, similar to someone being hit. He testified that as he turned back to see what was happening, he saw Peter Singate hit the disease again. He testified that the disease had already fallen on the floor, and Edward Singate also hit him. According to Alaji Kanye, Edward Singate gave him the stick, and he used, he gave him the stick he used, and asked him, as he, him turned around, and he saw the accused person, Pa Ali Gomez, BK Jata, Tumbul Tamba, and he hit the disease. He testified that he saw the accused person, took a stick and hit the disease. Alaji Kaji further stated that all of them were involved in hitting the disease to death. According to Alaji Kanye, after hitting the disease with a stick and he died, they were ordered by Edward Singate to put the body of the disease in the, in the official car of the disease on the passenger front seat. Alaji Kanye further testified that him, BK Jata, Pa Ali Gomez, and Tumbul Tamba later went back to the house of the accused person and cleaned the blood from the house of the accused person. Alaji Kanye stated that as they finished cleaning the house of the accused person, they came out but did not find the cars there and did not know where they went. Alaji Kanye testified that the following day, they heard rumors that one minister's car somersaulted around Jabang village and it got burnt. He testified that as they were in the camp, he saw Peter Singata's hand was burnt and covered by his uniform and nobody had the courage to tell what Peter, to tell that what Peter did. Under the circumstances, his evidence was not controverted. He maintained his evidence that he went to the, accu to the, uh, to the house of the accused person and that is where the disease was killed. He maintained that upon arrival at Edward Singata's, Edward's residence, he met Edward and Peter, but did not know the exact time, but it was around 8 p.m. onwards. He maintained that he was at the accused residence on the day in question. Upon arrival at the accused residence, he met the accused, but there was no guard. There were no guards and no family members. He maintained that all the, they, he maintained that they all participated in beating the disease to death in the accused person's house. The certified record of the record of the proceedings indicates between the state and Yankuba Ture and Fatumata Jahumpa Sise was admitted into evidence and marked as defense exhibit D5. The witness and the witness statement of Alaj Kanye was also admitted into evidence and marked as as defense exhibit D6. The transcript copy of the oral testimony of Alaji Kanye at the TRRC was admitted into evidence and marked as defense exhibit D8. PW7 sworn on the Holy Quran in English language and testified that his names are Muhammad Lamin, Muhammad LK Bojam, CRG, the chief of Combo North District and is a retired police officer. He stated that he knew both the accused person and the disease as, minister, as ministers in the Gambia in 1995. He also testified that, testified that the disease died in June 1995. He testified that in June 1995, as commander of the Criminal Investigation Department of the Police, he received information that the disease was involved in an accident along Sukuta Jambur Highway. He testified that he visited the said accident scene at the time and the body of the disease was removed and taken to the RVH. RVTX hospital in Banjul. He further testified that he observed that the car of the disease had no dent and did not somersault it as it was being rumored. He further testified that he took out the number plate of the car and took it with him and the registration number of the disease vehicle was GG1328A and it was a black Mercedes Benz. He also stated that he waited enough for the instruction from the Inspector General of Police for the matter to be investigated, and he received no such order from the Inspector General of Police, and the case was never investigated. On the cross-examination, the evidence of PW7 was not controverted by the defense. He stated that he was not aware of any corona inquest was carried out. PW8 won on the Holy Quran in English language, and testified that his names are Dr. Abdullah Bajan, 
a medical doctor and the head of Department of Pathology at Edward Francis Small Teaching Hospital. He testified that he knows Dr. Oldfield, a pathologist whom he had met in 2007. He testified that Dr. Oldfield is now diseased and he prepared Exhibit P3, a post-mortem report. The original copy of Exhibit P3 was admitted into evidence and marked as Exhibit P3A. On the cross-examination, there was no question. PW9 sworn on the Holy Quran in English language and testified that his names are Dr. Sana Sisi, a medical doctor and a causing of the disease. He testified that the accused was last seen in June 1995. He further testified that they all believed that the disease died the night of Friday, 23rd of June 1995. And they came to know about it on the 24th of June 1995 as one police inspector Mbai informed them that the diseased vehicle was found burnt by Jambu. Mm. He further testified that the disease had no family relatives that he could visit around Jambu's end. As at 1995, he testified that the diseased car was burned through intense heat and it was it turns white. He testified that he saw the accused passing at the funeral of the disease. On the cross-examination, he admitted that he is Dr. Sanasise, referred to in Exhibit P3A, the original copy of the post-mortem report, and denied that a corona inquest was set up. He admitted that an autopsy report was performed by one Dr. Fred Oldfield, a pathologist, and he prepared Exhibit P3A. The prosecution closed their case with PW9. Summary of the defense witness testimonies. DW1, sworn on the Holy Quran in English language and testified that her names are Awa Minti and is a sister-in-law to the accused person. She testified that she knows the accused person for a long time because the accused person was raised by her father, one Al-Haji Tumani Minti. She testified, she stated that she has been resident with the accused person since the accused person was resident in their house in Panju. She testified that in 1995 she lived in the house of the accused person in Kerseri together with her sister called Mami Minti, DW2, Fatuma Taturi, the daughter of the accused person, and her older sister, Mariama Minti, the accused cousin, brother, Bakari Turi, and, and the accused nephew called Adama Turi. He testified that they, all, they were living in the house with the oddlies who were in who were occupation of one of the rooms, and the home guards were in a converted garage to a room. She stated that one of the drivers of the accused person was Lamindu, PW4. She testified that he was ne she, was, she has never been to the house of Edward Singata alone or with her sister and niece. It is her testimony that in 1995, she was 10 years old and Lamindu, PW4, used to drive the accused to work and them to school. And in June 1995, she was at Kersari. On the cross-examination, she stated that she, was, she had a cordial relationship with the accused person whom he considered as a father. She also stated that the drivers and the, guard, and the security guards had very cordial relationship with the accused person. And with such a cordial relationship, there is no reason for the guards to harm the accused person. She stated that the accused son, Edward Ture, was born in December 1995. And the first two oddest of the accused were Ensa Mendy, PW2, and Jali Musa So. She admitted that she knows Edward Sigate as the Minister of Defense in 1995 and she has never be seen Edward Singata's family visit them at Kersering. However, she once saw Edward Singata visit their house in Kersering to attend the naming ceremony of Edward Turi, named after Edward Singata. She stated that she saw it in, your, it in the media that on the 23rd day of June, when Usman Koro Sisi was found dead in his car, but never heard that the disease was killed in their house. She did not know any reason why PW2 would lie against the accused person and did not know of any problem between Lamin Dur, any problem Lamin Dur, PW4 had with the diseased person and that and what she saw is what the accused is that the accused has excellent working relationship with the guards and the others. 
she admitted that she will do anything to protect the accused person. DW2 sworn on the Holy Quran in Mandinka language and testified that her names are Mami Minteturi and the wife of the accused person. She testified that in the whole of 1995, she did not go to the house of Edward Singate and she was pregnant at the time. She testified that the accused person herself, her, our Minte DW1, Fatima Ture, Jenova Kujabi, Maimuna, Adama Ture, Bakari Ture, Ensa Mendi, Jali Musa So, and Esba were living in the house of the accused person in Kersering, in the, in Kersering from the 1st of January 1995 to July 1995. It is our testimony that in 1995, they attended the naming ceremony of Edward Singata's child. And after that visit, she had a bed rest. She testified that in June 1995, the accused person told him the morning that the chairman was traveling out of the country. She testified that the accused person asked her to remove his uniform and, uni and iron it for him, and he would re-iron the uniform by himself. She testified that the accused returned to the house around 3 p.m., had lunch, and re-ironed his uniform and had a short sleep. She testified that she gave his, uni his shoes to PW2 who polished them for the accused person. She testified that on that day, PW2 and PW4 left the house and it was Jali Musa So who was on duty. After the accused had a short sleep, it was after 6 p.m. and was waiting for Jali Musa So and prepared snacks for the accused and that was after 7 p.m. prayers. He testified that the accused person, the accused said he could no longer wait for Jali Musa So because he, had, he has a meeting with his boss and thereafter he will proceed to the airport. She testified that after the accused left the, left the house, they were watching Nigerian movies and she was not feeling well. She testified that she did not have any personal relationship with Edward Singata's wife in June 1995. She testified that whilst watching a movie, the accused returned to the house around 12 a.m. to 1 a.m. Twelve midnight to one a.m. She testified that the accused used to go to Banjul every Saturday morning to play football. On the cross examination, she stated that her first male child was named after Edward Singate and was born in 1995. And Edward Singate, the naming ceremony, the naming She testified that she could not remember the name of the Nigerian movies that they were watching when the accused person returned to the house from the airport in the night in question. She further testified that she knew of no reason why the prosecution witnesses will have cause to lie against the accused person and as to the best of her knowledge, they had a cordial relationship. She admitted that she would do anything to make the accused person happy because she loves the accused person very much. DW3 is the accused person, and he sworn on the Holy Quran in English language and testified that his names are Yankuba Ture. And uh, in June 1995, he was a member of the Armed Forces Provisional Ruling Council and a minister for, the lo for local government and lands. He testified that in June 1995, Ensa Mendi and one Jali Musa So were his orderlies, but, did, but not his bodyguard. It is his testimony that PW4 was his official driver in June 1995, and he denied that he sent Ensa Mendi and uh, Lamin, to Lamin Ndur to his house on Friday. He testified that in June 1995, he went for the usual Friday prayers at King Fahad Mosque in Banju. He further stated that after Friday, he picked his children from school and went home with them to Kerseri. According to the accused, when he reached you know, his house with his driver and Odlis, he gave them, at his driver and Odlis, PW2 and PW4, he gave them fares to go home for the weekend as he will drive himself to the airport. He further testified that he ate lunch and slept for some time and later went to the, to the state house to meet, the, to meet Chairman Janna. The accused person further testified that after he finished a meeting with the said chairperson Janna, the chairman asked him to drive with him to the airport. The accused further testified that after the chairman, after chairman, after 
chairperson of Jame departed. He joined the chairman's car with his driver, one Pamala, with whom he drove back to the state house. According to the accused person, he arrived at the state house around 12 midnight. He stated that after alighting from the chairman's car, he had a little chat with the then state guard, Captain Lan Tombong Tamba. According to the accused person, he left the state house and drove his car to his residence at Kirsiri, where he arrived around 12, between 12, 12 midnight to 1 a.m. The accused person further stated that when he reached the home, he found his wife watching TV with other people. He stated that he went inside his house and uh, reprimanded his orderly, Jali Musa son, who came to work late on that day. He denied that he knows Ahmad Jangom and further denied instructing Jangom and others to abandon their post and denied killing Usman Koro Sisi. On the cross-examination, the accused person in the accused person in response to questions from the prosecution confirmed that he had a jovial relationship with Esa Mendi, Ahmad Jango, and uh, Lamin Do. He further confirmed that he knew of no reason why all three of his former subordinates would choose to falsely testify against him. He admitted that Ensa Mendi was his ugly and Lamin Do was his official driver. He maintained that he returned to the state house with Pa Malang from the airport. He admitted that he was a member of the Armed Forces Provisional Ruling Council when Usman Koro Sise was murdered and uh, cannot remember whether the AFPRC conducted an investigation in the murder of Oro Sisi. He admitted that he had rumor of the death of Usman Koro Sisi. He admitted on Friday, 23rd June 29, 1995, he picked his children from school together with his orderly and driver. He admitted that the communication between his guard commander, duty sergeant, and platoon commander was by way of walkie-talkie. He denied that he participated in the murder of Usman Koro Sise at his residence. The defense closed their case with DW3 and with the consent of the respective counsel for the defense and the prosecution, written briefs of arguments were ordered. Counsel for the defense filed their brief on the 17th day of May 2021 and the prosecution filed their brief on the 9th day of June 2021. Defense counsel waived his right to file a reply on points of law. Counsel for the defense in his brief of argument formulated one issue for determination, and that is whether the prosecution has established the offense of murder against the accused beyond reasonable doubt. It is the submission of defense counsel that for a conviction to be secured, death must occur. The accused was the murderer, and the accused acted or omitted to act with malice aforethought. Defense counsels relied on the case of Bach Samba Fai and the state 2001 to 2015 Gambia Supreme Court Law Report 37 and section 190 of the Criminal Procedure Code and section 141 of the Evidence Act 1994. Defense counsel referred this court to the case of Wilmington and DPP 1935 AC 462 and the case of Odusin and the state 2007, 29 NSCOR. It is the submission of defense counsel that exhibit P3 and exhibit P3A is the finding of the pathologist created a doubt as to the cause of death of the disease. Defense counsel argued that the oral testimonies of, of the oral testimonies of Alaji Kanye and uh, Dr. Abdullahi Bajan cannot be conclusive piece of evidence that this court can rely on as a fact that the disease died. It is the submission of defense of counsel for the defense that the only piece of evidence as to the cause of death of the disease is the oral testimony of Alaji Khan and argued that the prosecution failed to prove the case beyond reasonable doubt as the alleged murder weapon was never tendered into evidence as exhibit. Defense counsel relies on a plethora of cases and submitted that the prosecution failed to prove its case against the accused person and humbly urge this honorable court to acquit and discharge the accused person. Counsel for the prosecution in his brief of argument formulated three issues for determination, and they are as follows. One, whether the evidence of Alaji Kanye, PW6, an accomplice has been collaborated by other evidence, which could warrant this honorable court to convict the accused person. 
Two, whether the prosecution has proven the charge of murder beyond reasonable doubt against the accused person. Three, whether the accused person properly raised the defense of alibi in his case. If so, whether he, can, and he is entitled to the defense of alibi. With regards to their first issue, counsel for the prosecution relies on section 181 of the Evidence Act and the case of Colonel Lamin Bobaji and six others versus the state, 2010 to 2012. Gambia Supreme Court Law Report 5543 at page 570 and submitted that the evidence of Alaji Kanye is relevant and reliable for the purpose of proving the elements of the offense with which the accused person stands charged. The prosecution argued that the testimonies of Ensa Mendi, Hamad Jangob, Lamin Du, Pa Habib Mbai, and Muhammad L.K. Bojab are consistent with the testimony of, the, of Alaji Kanye. With regards to their second issue, it is the submission of the prosecuting counsel that the prosecution has proved the charge of murder beyond reasonable doubt. The prosecution argued that it is a notorious fact that the disease is dead and that both of the and both all the and that all the prosecution witnesses and defense witnesses acknowledge it. The prosecution submitted the prosecution submitted that it is not in dispute that the death of Usma of a human being has taken place and refers this court to the testimony of Alaji Kani, where he testified that the accused and him were among the group of men who beat the disease with a stick in the house of the accused person until he died. The prosecution refers to the plethora of case law authorities and submitted that the prosecution has proved the charge and the, proved the charge of murder beyond reasonable doubt against the accused person. With regards to their third issue, the prosecution submitted that the plea of alibi is not available to the accused person. It is their submission that the accused person only raised a, the plea of alibi in court, precisely during his examination in chief. The prosecution argued that the accused did not raise the plea of alibi with the police when he was confronted by the police in relation to the allegation contained in the information in this case. The prosecution argued that the accused refused to speak to the police and simply invoke constitutional immunity that never was. The prosecution refers this court to exhibit A, the cautionary statement. Counsel for the prosecution submitted that this honorable court will note from exhibit A that the cautionary statement of the accused person, that the accused made no mention of his whereabouts on the 23rd day, 23rd day of June 1995 around 9 p.m. or thereabout when the offense was committed. It is the submission, it is, it is the submission of the defense counsel that is the duty, the duty was on the accused person to inform the police about his whereabouts in the light of the allegation made against him. It is the submission of the prosecution that the accused person, by failing to inform the police at the earliest opportunity when he was arrested, deprived the police of the opportunity to further investigate the alibi, to ascertain its truth or falsity. Thus, failure of the accused person to raise the plea of alibi timely, timely and properly warrants same to be rejected and relied on plethora of cases within and outside the jurisdiction of this court. Counsel for the prosecution urged this honorable court to find that the accused pass, to find the accused person guilty of murder of Usman Koro Sisi and sentence him according to section 188 of the criminal code. I have listened very carefully to the oral testimonies of the prosecution and defense witnesses adduced during the trial, and I have read in detail the respective written briefs of arguments filed herein. In as much as I have looked at the testimonies of the testimonies in detail, I have also read the brief of argument with great interest. In order to ensure fairness, I will only limit my comments, my observations, and my findings as it relates to the charge of murder. Contrary to section 187 of the Criminal Code, Cap 10, Volume 3, Laws of the Gambia. I believe for proper determination of the alleged murder of Usman Koro Sisi, the prosecution raised three issues, and these three issues encompass the lone issue raised by the defense counsel in his brief of argument. I shall therefore adopt the three issues as mine as follows. One, whether the evidence of Alaji Kanye an accomplice has been corroborated by other evidence which would warrant this honorable court to convict the accused person. Two, whether the prosecution has proved the charge of murder beyond reasonable doubt against the accused person. And three, whether the accused person 
properly raise the defense of alibi in his case? If so, whether he is entitled to the defense of alibi. With regards to the first issue, as to whether the evidence of Alajikani and accused has been corroborated by other evidence, which could warrant this honorable court to convict the accused person, is a fundamental issue in this murder trial. The principle of law in this jurisdiction is that an accomplice is a competent witness against an accused person. And for clarity, I here under reproduce section 181 of the Evidence Act 1994, CAP 606, Volume 2, Laws of the Gambia, and it states as follows, and I quote, subject to the express provisions of any other law to the contrary, an accomplice shall be a competent witness against an accused person and a conviction shall not be illegal or reversed or altered on appeal, merely because it proceeds, against, it proceeds upon the uncorroborated testimony of an accomplice. Emphasis on the line, unquote. The import of section 181 of the evidence, at supra, is that the corroboration of the evidence of an accomplice is not required by law on a crime of murder because section 45 of the Courts Act has been repealed. What is now required is for the court to consider the witness as credible and capable of being be of belief, despite him being an accomplice. In the book, The Law of Evidence, revised second edition, 2016, by Asan B. Jalo at page 216, define an accomplice as a participis criminis i.e. a partner of the accused person in the commission of the crime with which the accused is charged, unquote. The landed author and eminent jurist further states that the prosecuting authorities within the common law jurisdiction often resort to the use of accomplices as witnesses in situations where it would be otherwise difficult to prove the case. From the foregoing, an accomplice is certainly a person that participates in a, in a crime for which the accused now stand in court, is being tried. And if he is tried with him on the same evidence, he would equally be guilty with the accused being tried. In law, an accomplice is a competent witness against an accused person. And conviction based on, based on the evidence of, an, of such accomplice is not illegal, even where such evidence is not corroborated. It is up to the trial judge to make sure that he or she weighs seriously such uncorroborated evidence of an accomplice before convicting on it. In the Gambia Supreme Court case of Colonel Lamin Bo Baji and six others versus the state, 2010 to 2012, Gambia Supreme Court Law, Supreme Court law Report 143 at Holding 6 held as follows, and I quote, an accomplice has always been a competent witness and the uncorroborated evidence of an accomplice it has, is admissible in law." Unquote. It is the testimony of Alaji Kani that he is an accomplice to the crime which the accused is charged with. Alaji Kani gave extensive evidence on how they himself, Edward Singate, Peter Singate, BK Jata, Tumbul Tamba, Pa Ali Gomez, and Yanku Baturi, the accused, beat the deceased Usman Koro Sisi with a pistol and other objects in the house of the, of the accused, passing at Kerseri until the disease died. This evidence has not been materially contradicted or controverted on the cross-examination. Alaji Kani also gave evidence that he took part in putting the body of, the, of Usman Koro Sisi. Sisi in his official vehicle on the instruction of Edward Singati. From this evidence, I therefore hold as a fact that Alaji Kani is an accomplice to the murder of Usman Koro Sisi and is therefore a competent witness. I have carefully perused the testimony of Us Alaji Kani on the cross-examination and there is nothing before this honorable court which impedes Alaji Kani being an accomplice and a competent witness. In my view, Alaji Kani is a credible witness and his evidence is relevant, reliable and admissible for the purpose of establishing the ingredients of the offense with which the accused passing stands charged. As per section 181 of the Evidence Act, a conviction cannot be reversed on appeal simply because it was based on the uncorroborated evidence of an accomplice. 
notwithstanding the fact that an, an uncorroborated evidence of an accused is, ad, is admissible. I shall, however, proceed to evaluate the evidence of Alaji Kanye and find out whether it has been corroborated or not. Section 178, 179 of the Evidence Act defines corroboration as follows, and I quote, corroboration consists of independent evidence from which, an ir from which a reasonable interference can be drawn, which confirms or support in some material particular the evidence to be corroborated and connects the relevant passing with the offense, with the offense claim or defense, emphasis on the line. As to the definition of corroboration, the Supreme Court of the Gambia in, Lantum, in Lieutenant General Lantum Bontamba versus the state, 2014 to 2015, Gambia Supreme Court Law Report 221 at 230, also defines corroboration in terms of section 179, supra, which states as follows, and I quote, from the definition, it can be discerned that corroborating evidence must be independent. And in this context, it means it must be distinct and separate and does not rely on a source on the evidence that it corroborates as the contrary may amount to self-corroboration. Further, the corroborating evidence must confirm or support in some material particular the evidence, of the evidence to be corroborated. I understand this to mean that the corroborating evidence must be relevant and logically relate to and connects the relevant passing with the offense. Finally, the corroborating evidence connects the relevant passing with the offense if it tends to point to or implicates the relevant passing in the commission of the offense, unquote. It is this, it, in our instant case, Alaji Kanye gave evidence that when they arrived at the residence of the accused person in Kersherin, the place was empty. That is, the guards on duty at the residence of the accused person were not there, as well as his family. This piece of evidence is supported by the evidence of Ensa Mendi, Hamad Jangom, and Lamin Dur, that the accused person had instructed Ahmad Jangom for his family to be removed from the residence and taken to the residence of Edward Singate, where a party was organized. Ensa Mendi and Lamin Dur both testified that before the departure to the airport, the accused person asked them to return to his house with his official vehicle while he departed from the airport to order in, in, another, in another vehicle. Additionally, Ahmad Jangom gave evidence that he was further instructed by the accused person to go on a patrol at the beach with the guards at his residence. Ahmad Jangom gave evidence that after taking the accused person's family to the residence of Edward Singate, Lamindu took him and the guards to the beach for patrol. Lamindu stated that when he returned to the house of the accused person, after dropping Ahmad Jangom and the guards, he found a lot of cars parked outside. He said that he did not enter in the house, but simply went to a friend's house where he spent some time. But upon his return to the house, the cars were gone. Ahmad Jangom also testified that after the patrol, they returned to the house of the accused person, but he met with Edward Singate inside the compound. And he said Edward Singate asked him to go back on the patrol at the beach. He testified that he found cars parked outside the residence of the accused person. It is the evidence of Lamindu that when he entered the house of the accused, the place looked messy. From patrol, the floor of the house was wet and muddy. In my opinion, the evidence of Ensa Mendi, Hamad Jangong, Lamindu supports the testimony of Alaji Kanye that after hitting the disease with pistol, there was blood all over the house of the accused, of the, of the, the house of the accused person, and, they, and that they were instructed to clean the house. The charred remains of the disease were found in his official car, which was burned to ashes along the Sukuta Jambur Highway. I must say that all the prosecution witnesses gave evidence to support this piece of evidence. Alaji Kanye, evidence shows that the accused person, Peter Singater, Edward Singater, left with the body of the disease in his official vehicle. And the only reasonable conclusion that may be inferred from this evidence is that the said vehicle and the body of the disease were disposed of along Sukuta Jambur Highway by the accused person, Peter Singater and Edward Singater, and Edward Singater. 
Pak Habib Mbai, the crime management coordinator, at the time gave evidence of receiving information from one Mr. Charm, an informant from Sukuta, that the car of a minister and Land Rover resembling that of Edward Singate was seen along the highway at around 1 a.m. in the morning of the 24th of June 1995. Mohamed Lamin Boja, Mohamed L.K. Boja, was a police investigator at the time, equally testified before the Honorable Court that he visited the scene of the alleged incident and positively identified the vehicle belonging to the former Minister of, Minister of Finance, Usman Koro Sisi, and even took out the number plates. The above testimonies of Edward Singate, Hamad Jangam, Lamendur, Pa Habib Mbai, Mohamed L.K. Boja are consistent with the testimony of Alaji Kali. I therefore reach the conclusion that the evidence of the prosecution witnesses materially con corroborated the evidence of Alaji Kanye, and I therefore resolve this first issue to the effect that the evidence of Alaji Kanye as an accomplice has been sufficiently corroborated in this trial. With regards to the second issue, as to whether the prosecution has proved the charge of murder, con charge of murder beyond reasonable doubt against the accused person is the main crux of this trial. It is a cardinal principle in the adversarial system of our of adjudication in our criminal justice setup is well established that the legal and evidential burden of proving every element of the offense beyond reasonable doubt lies on the prosecution. Although the prosecution can do so by either direct or circumstantial evidence, the law requires that in either case the prosecution bears the legal and the legal burden of proving all the in elements of the offense necessary to establish the guilt of the accused beyond reasonable doubt. See the case of Wilmington and DPP, 1935 AC 426-461, where Viscount Sankey, Elsie said, and I quote, throughout the web of the English criminal law, one golden thread is always to be seen, and that is the duty of the prosecution to prove the prisoner's guilt, subject to the defense of insanity, and subject also to any statutory exception, unquote. From the foregoing, it is clear that the prosecution must succeed on the strength of its own evidence and not allow to rely on the weakness of the defense or the lies told by the accused as the basis for a conviction. I therefore hold the strong view that to succeed, the prosecution must lead copious, cogent, compelling, and unequivocal evidence, which unsecondly points to the accused person as the man who committed the alleged murder of Usman Koro Sisi. The prosecution, therefore, has the unsifting burden of proving all the ingredients of the offense with which the accused has been charged. See the Gambia Court of Appeal case of Momo Dijalo and Commissioner of Police, 1960 to 1993, Gambia Law Report 39. Indeed, it has been held in the case of Dua and the State, 2010, 2 MJSC, 152-80-170. And I quote, the reasonable doubt which justifies an acquittal. Acquittal is a doubt based on reason arising from evidence or lack of it. It is a doubt which, which reasonable man or woman might entertain. It is not a fanciful doubt. It is not an imaginary doubt. It is not a doubt where a, where a prudent man will hesitate before acting in matters of importance to themselves, unquote, emphasis added. On the, on the single count of murder, contrary to section 187 of the criminal code, CAP 1001, volume 3, Laws of the Gambia, 2009, and the particulars of offense alleged is that Yankuba Turi, sometime in the month of June 1995, at Kololi in the West Coast region of the Gambia, within the jurisdiction of this honorable court and with malice aforethought, caused the death of Usman Koro Sisi by beating him with a pistol like and other dangerous weapons and thereby committed an offense. I will now proceed to state the law on murder, contrary to section 187 of the criminal code under which Yankuba Ture stands accused, as, and it states that, and I quote, any person who of malice aforethought causes the death of another person by unlawful act or omission is guilty of murder, unquote. I must stress that the offense of murder is one of the heinous and abominable crimes of our land, and that when committed and the culprit is charged, tried, and found guilty upon all the available evidence presented before the court, including his defense thereto, it attacks nothing but a death, sent a a, but a death sentence to the accused. It is in, it is in cons consequence of this that the law is set deeply entrenched the criteria for the prosecution must prove for the prosecution must meet before a conviction 
of, for murder could be secured. It follows that the prosecution must prove in accordance with section 144 one of the Evidence Act and prove the case beyond reasonable doubt. To secure a, to secure a conviction of, the, of an accused person charged with murder under section 187 of the Criminal Code, the Supreme Court of the Gambia held in the case of Bach Samba Fai and the state 2002 to 2014 to 2015, Gambia Supreme Court the report at 37 that the prosecution has the duty to prove beyond reasonable doubt that one death occur, two that the accused was the murderer, three that the act or omission of the accused was unlawful, and four that the acts that the accused acted or omitted to act with malice aforethought. To sustain a conviction. All the above ingredients must be clearly proved. It is also the duty of the prosecution to prove not only that the act of the accused or his omission could have caused the death of the disease, but that it actually caused the death. It is not enough, therefore, to prove that the disease died or was killed. I shall therefore proceed to examine the, the ingredients outlined above in sequence as stipulated in the Bach Sambafai's case, Supra. With regards to the first ingredient, as to whether the death of Usman Korosisi disease occurred constitutes the actus reus of the child. It is tried law that, the, that proof of a murder case can either be by direct or circumstantial evidence that a human being was killed and his or her death is caused by someone with malice aforethought. During the course of the trial, the prosecution witnesses gave evidence that Usman Korosise was found dead in his car in June 1995 with his body charred beyond recognition. Alagi Kanye testified that the accused person and uh, him were among the group of men who beat the disease with a stick in the house of the accused person until he died. He described that, he described that Usman Korosise was hit with a stick by Edward Singate, Peter Singate, P.K. Jata, P. Pa Ali Gomez and Jean Kubaturi, the accused, and himself. It is the evidence of Alaji Kanye that he was instructed by Edward Singate to put the body of the Usman Koro Sisi in his official car, which he did with BK Jata and Tumbul Tamba. Alaji, Alaji Kanye also testified that as they, BK Jata, Tumbul Tamba, and himself went back to the house of Jean Kubaturi to clean the blood, there, whereby the whereby Jan Kubature, together with Peter Singate and Edward Singate, went with the body of Usman Koro Sisi in his official car. Pa Habib Mbai and Mohamed L.K. Bojan, who were both investigating officers, led evidence that the body of the disease was found in his car along Sukuta Jamun Highway, alongside a bridge. They both confirmed that the charred body was removed from the diseased official car and taken to the mortuary in Banjul for examination. Dr. Sana Sisi confirmed that as a cousin to Usman Koro Sisi, he was present when the said medical examination was conducted on the remains of Usman Koro Sisi. He furthermore, Ensa Mendi, Hamad Jangam, Lamin Dur, Awa Minti, and Mami Minti all confirmed that they had radio announcement of the death of Usman Koro Sisi, who was purported to have been involved in an accident with his official car along the Sukuta Jambur Highway. Even though Exhibit P3A states that the body found in the official car of the disease was presumed body of Usman Koro Sisi, the said presumption is supported by cogent and compelling evidence before this honorable court. Firstly, the evidence of Alaji Kanye clearly shows that the disease, the clearly shows that the death body of the disease was placed in his official car. He gave evidence also that the said official car of the disease was driven away by Edward Singate, Peter Singate, and the accused person. Secondly, the evidence of Pa Habib Mbai and Muhammad Lamin Bojan shows that the remain which were subject of exhibit P3A was found in the official car of the disease during the material time in question. Dr. Sana Sisi, a cousin to the accused to the disease, also corroborated this fact. Thirdly, the evidence of Pa Habib Mbai shows that he was given information by, the, by an informant that the car of Edward Singate plus the minister's car was seen going towards Sukuta Jambul around 1 a.m. in June 1995. The said car description fits the description of the disease. The totality of all this evidence that, and circumstances 
clearly shows that the body found in the car that in the in the car was that of the disease and this i shall hold as a fact it is an irrefutable evidence of the prosecution witnesses that the disease has died dr sana sisi has led evidence to the effect that the disease since 20, since 25th of june 1995 has not been seen or heard from. The law in this jurisdiction is that a person shown, a person shown not to have been heard for seven years by those who, if he or she has been alive, would naturally have heard, have heard from him, of him or her is presumed dead. This principle of law is provided in section 151 of the Evidence Act 19, 1994, which provides as follows, and I quote, a person shown not to have been heard of for seven years by those, if any, if he or she has been alive, would naturally have heard of him or her, is presumed to be dead, unless the circumstances of the case are such as to account for his or her not being heard of without assuming his or her death. But there is no presumption as to the time when he or she died. And the burden of proving his or her death at a particular time is on the person who asserts it." Unquote. Usman Koro Sisi has not been heard of nor seen by his family member since Saturday, 24 June 1994, according to the evidence of Dr. Sana Sisi. The evidence of Dr. Sana Sisi was not challenged or controverted by the accused person. Therefore, the Usman Koro Sisi, not being heard or seen by his family for over two decades, can clearly and conclusively be presumed dead in terms of Section 1501 of the Evidence Act, when read together with the evidence of the prosecution witnesses. Furthermore, and most importantly, there are abundant case law authorities on the issue of copious directive in murder cases. The law knows that there are instances and circumstances where an accused person takes measures to destroy the body in order to avoid prosecution or conviction if prosecuted. Accordingly, there is evidence that a human being was killed by another human being. The latter can be convicted when the body of the former is not found. The important consideration is whether there is nexus between the accused and the killing of the victim, in order to the extent that the court comes to the conclusion that it is the accused who killed the disease. In Babuga and the state 1996 serving NWLR PT 46279-296, at 296, ONU as Justice of the Supreme Court said, and I quote, as a matter of fact, conviction can properly be secured in the absence of corpus delecti, where there is strong direct evidence. It is true that the body of the disease has not been recovered, but it is settled that where there is positive evidence that the disease has died, failure to recover his body need not frustrate conviction." Unquote. I should hard hear that an accused person has always been as I should add here that an accused person can also be convicted on strong and compelling circumstantial evidence in the absence of corpus directing. The evidence need not, necess need not necessarily be direct. I must say that there is enough evidence on record that the body of Usman Koro Sisi was born to ashes. However, how can then the corpus directing be found? The position of the law is that the effect that where there is facts before the court from which it can be inferred that the body examined by the doctor is that of the disease and the medical evidence can be dispensed with. The Supreme Court of Nigeria in the case of Abbas Muhammad and the State 2017 LPELR 42098 Supreme Court had the following to say on the subject and I quote, so the appellant choice of attack against the decision of the court below appeal against is on the is on the identification of the corpse. He was charged with culpable homicide, punishable with death. The position of the law is that where medical evidence is essential as to the cause of death, it is invariable also essential that the person who allegedly identified the corpse of the disease to the doctor is called to testify as to the identification unless 
identity of the deceased can be inferred from the circumstances of the case. The position, however, is that if there are facts from which it can be inferred that the corpse examined by a doctor was that of the disease, the evidence of the person, dead or alive, said to have identified the corpse is not indispensable. Indeed, a conviction for murder can be made without the recovery of the dead body if there is positive evidence that the disease has been killed. Emphasis. In effect, the need you know, for anyone to identify the body of the disease to a doctor is not a sine qua non in all murder cases. Besides, it is also tried that medical evidence through desirable or in, desirable in establishing cause of death in the case of murder is also essential, provided that there are facts which sufficiently shows cause of death to the satisfaction of the court." Unquote. From the foregoing reasoning, I have reached the ultimate conclusion that the death of the disease occurred and the prosecution has proved with the certainty required by law that the disease has died, and this I shall hold as a fact. With regards to the second issue as to whether the accused was the murderer is a fundamental element you know, of the charge of murder. The evidence led by the prosecution proves that the accused person is the murderer of the disease. The testimony of Alaji Kanye shows a grand scheme of conspiracy by Edward Singate, Peter Singate, and the accused person to kill Usman Koro Sisi. Alaji Kanye gave evidence that they, BK Jata, Tumbul Tamba, and Pa Aliu Gomez, were briefed by Edward Singate when they were going to get rid of someone and they were taken to the residence of the accused person in Kerseri. Alaji Kanye stated that at the time of the uh, at time of arrival at the residence of the accused person, there were no guards or family members of the accused in his residence. Alaji Kanye further gave evidence of how Edward Singate and Peter Singate went to the airport while he was instructed to be on guard at the residence of the accused person. Alaji Kanye also gave evidence that the said Edward Singate and Peter Singate returned to the residence of the accused person from the airport. He stated that the accused person came with them to his residence. Alaji Kanye further, further gave evidence that Edward Singate arrived at the residence of the accused person with the disease, and it was, and, and it was signaled to him, Alaji Kanye, by Edward Singate, that the disease was the one to be killed. Alaji Kanye further went on to give eyewitness account of how Peter Singate used a pistol to hit the disease, followed by Edward Singate. He also gave evidence that the accused person also used the same pistol to hit the disease, whom at the time fell on the ground. He also gave evidence that BK Jata, Tumbul Tamba, Pa Ali Gomez, and himself were instructed by the accused, by Edward Singate, to hit the disease with the said pistol, which they pistol which they did. I have observed the demeanor of Alaji Kanye whilst testifying in tears as to how Usman Koro Sisi was burgoing to death. In my view, the tears from Alaji, Alaji Kanye were not crocodile tears. They were tears of remorse and regret. Alaji Kanye testified that the place was full of blood and that Edward Singata instructed them to place the body of Usman Koro Sisi in his official car vehicle, which they did. Alaj Kanye also gave evidence of how they, BK Jata, Tumbul Tamba, Pa Alu Gomez, and himself were instructed to clean the blood in the house of the accused person. While Edward, Sing Edward Singate, Peter Singate, and the accused himself left with the body of the deceased. I must say that the above piece of evidence by Alaj Kanye shows that the accused person was a primary participant in the killing of Usman Koro Sisi. Alaj Kanye, as an eyewitness, stated how the accused person together with Edward Singate, Peter Singate, BK Jata, Tumbul Tamba, Pa Ali Gomez, and himself used a pistol to hit Ed Usman Koro Sisi to death. Alaji Kanye's evidence also shows that when they finished hitting the disease to death with the said pistol, they placed his body in the disease official vehicle. I must say clearly that this evidence has not been con materially controverted or challenged by the, prosecu by the accused person and there was no pro enough cross-examination to destroy the veracity of the evidence of Alaji Kani. Under our, under our criminal law, a person becomes a party to a crime if he or she actually does the act or takes or makes the omission which constitutes the crime. And this is provided under Section 23 1A of the Criminal Code 
CAP 10 laws of the Gambia 2009, which states, and I quote, when an offense is committed, each of the following persons is deemed to have taken part in committing the offense and to be guilty of this offense and may be charged with actually committing it. That is to say, A, every person who actually does the act or makes omission which constitutes the offense, unquote. On exhibit P3, P3A, the post-mortem report shows the cause of death as follows. I quote, a presumptive pathological diagnosis of death by fire is offered in the absence of a positive finding otherwise, unquote. It is therefore apparent on exhibit P3, P3A, that the cause of death of the disease was by fire. The finding is, is clear that the conclusion of death by fire is based on a presumption which is offered in the absence of a positive finding otherwise. I must say that the said finding was based on the fact that the remains of the disease were what, were what was presented for medical examination and the report of which is contained in Exhibit P3 and 3A. This fact was borne out of the evidence of Muhammad Laming, Muhammad L.K. Bojak, who testified as to how the remains of the disease were removed from his vehicle found along Sukuta Jambur Highway and taken to the Royal Victoria, Teaching, Royal Victoria Hospital for post-mortem examination. The nature in which the remains of the disease was presented for medical examination could have stated that the disease was hit with a pistol by the accused and his co-conspirators, taking into consideration of the following circumstances antecedent to the said death by fire, which is, ref which, which is preferred to in Exhibit P3A, the post-mortem report. And I what A, that the evidence led by the prosecution shows that there was a high scheme of conspiracy hatched by Edward Singate, Peter Singate, and the accused person to kill the disease, allergic honey. Alaji Kanye gave evidence of how they met at the house of Edward Singate and were briefed by Edward, Mr. Singate that they were going to get rid of the disease. His evidence shows that they drove to the residence of the accused person, which at the time was empty and there was no guards or family members of the accused person in the said house. B, the evidence of Ensa Mendi, Hamad Jangong, Lamin Du, clearly shows how the accused and shows that the guards at his residence were not present at the residence, at the residence and so also his family members. Ahmad Jangong, who was the guard commander, also gave evidence that the accused person instructed him from telephone in his house to take the guards on patrol around BB Hotel because they got information that there is a boat coming with arms and ammunition. He also gave evidence that the accused person also informed him that he should pack his family members in his, in, his, in his house and take them to the residence of Edward Singate, as there was a party at the said residence. He also gave evidence of the accused person, that the accused person told him that he was sending a vehicle which he should use to take the family members to Edward's residence at Cape Point, Bacal. Additionally, Lamin Dur and Ensa Mendi gave evidence that the accused person asked them to go to his residence. Both Ensa and Lamin Dur corroborated the fact that all the members of the accused person's family at his residence were taken to the residence of Edward Singate on the basis that there was a party going on there. Ensa Mendi, Hamad Jangom, Lamin Dur also confirmed that they went on patrol to the beach as instructed by the accused person. They also confirmed that when they returned to the residence of the accused person from the patrol, they found cars parked outside, outside the house. Amal Jangom stated that when he went inside the residence, Edward Sigata instructed him to return to the, patro to the patrol with the guards, and they did, which they did. See, Alajin Kanye testified that after Usman Koro Sise was struck with a pistol until he fell down and died. They were instructed by Edward Singate to place the body of Usman Koro Sise in his official vehicle, which they did. Alaji Kanye also gave evidence that when they placed the body of Usman Koro Sise in his official car, they went inside the accused person's house to clean the blood therein. He testified that when they finished cleaning the house, they went outside but found that Edward Singate, Peter Singate, and the accused person had left with the vehicles that were that were parked outside. The Edward S. R. Mendy, Ahmad Jangom, Lamin Dur, 
par Habib Mbaye, Aladji Kanye, Mohamed LK Bojang, and Dr. Sana Sisi all testify that the car of the disease was found along Sukuta Jambul Highway, burnt to ashes. Their evidence shows that the body of the disease was charred beyond recognition. It was ashes and bones of the disease, which were recovered from the burnt vehicle and presented for medical examination. From the, fo from the foregoing reasons, the above pieces of, pieces of evidence and circumstances clearly shows that the accused was involved in beating the disease with a pistol at his residence. It is also clear from the evidence that after the disease was struck with a pistol on many occasions, his body was placed in his official car. Furthermore, the accused person together with Edward Singate and Peter Singate left with the body of the disease after he was killed in the, in the residence of the accused person. Additionally, the evidence of Pahabi Mumbai shows that the vehicle of the disease and that of Edward Singate were seen heading towards Sukuta Jambur Highway around at, around, at, at 1 a.m. of 24th of June 1994. From a careful study of the evidence on records, it is apparent that the above evidence did not only show that the accused actually took part in the crime of killing Usman Koro Sisi by hitting him with a pistol. He has also taken part in the scheme to dispose the, of the body of the deceased by burning the body beyond recognition with a view to conceal the crime. And this I shall hold as a fact. All the prosecution witnesses confirmed that it was announced over the radio and newspapers that the, accused, that the vehicle Vehicles, vehicle of the disease was involved in an accident. However, the evidence of Pa Abib Mbai and Mohamed LK Boja as experienced police investigators shows that the said vehicle could not have been involved in an accident as it was announced. Their conclusion was based on the fact that the car had no dent or any remarkable thing which could, be, which could suggest that the disease was involved in an accident. The circumstances of this case clearly prove that the accused person with his co-conspirators burned the body of the disease in order to cover their heinous crime of killing their colleague state minister. Pa Habib Mbai gave evidence that when he went to the mortuary in Banjul, where the remains of the disease were taken, he saw Peter Singate at the said mortuary. He gave evidence that the hands of Peter Singate were, burnt, were in bandages, as in were in bandages and he intentionally made a remark that there was a foul play in the death of the disease. According to pa Habib Mbai, when he made the said comment, he noticed that the countenance of Peter Singate changed. It is an undisputed fact that the disease was a cabinet colleague of the accused person and Edward Singate. The disease was no ordinary citizen in the Gambia at the time as he was the Minister of Finance. The accused person and his co conspirator ensure that no investigation was carried out in relation to the death of the disease for over two decades. The evidence of Pa Abibu Bay and that when he began his investigation into the death of the disease, he was summoned by the accused person to his office. He gave evidence of how the accused person looked at him and asked him to leave his office. Pa Abibu Bay gave account of how he was dismissed from the police shortly after he visited the office of the accused person. On the cross-examination, the accused confirmed and maintained that to the best of his knowledge, no thorough investigation was carried out. The question that begs an answer is why was no investigation was launched into the death of the disease by the accused person and his cabinet colleagues. colleagues. If they did not have anything to hide from the public, why were, the poli why were the people who started investigating the case dis were dismissed from the service of the police? The obvious answer is that if the accused person had nothing to hide about the death of the disease, investigations would have been allowed to go on without any form of intimidation towards the investigators or their dismissal, as in the case of Pa Habib Mumbai. It is our con it, it is the submission. I hold that it is I hold that the above piece of evidence of piece of evidence corroborate the evidence of Alaji Kani and inextricably link the accused person to the death of the disease. I therefore hold as a fact that the accused person took active part in not only beating the disease to death, but that he also took part in burning his body beyond recognition in order to cover his crime. 
from the totality of the evidence placed before this honorable court, I have reached the conclusion and satisfied that the prosecution has proved the second ingredient with the certainty required by law that the accused is the murderer of Usman Koro Sisi. With regards to the third ingredient as to whether the act of the act or omission of the accused person was unlawful is not in dispute. It is clear from the evidence led by the prosecution that the killing of the disease by the accused person and his co-conspirators is, un is unlawful. The accused person nor his co The accused person, nor his co-conspirators, conspiracy, had no legal basis for killing Usman Koro Sisi. And I therefore resolve the third ingredient that the act or the omission of the accused was unlawful. With regards to the fourth ingredient as to whether the accused acted or omitted to act with malice aforethought and caused the death of the disease is an essential ingredient of the offense of, of, of the offense child. A malice aforethought is defined under section 190 of the criminal code as follows, and I quote, criminal procedure code as follows. Malice aforethought shall be deemed to be established by evidence proving any or more of the circumstances. A, an intention to cause the death or to do grievous harm to a person whether the person is the person actually killed or not. B, whether that the act or the omission cause, causing death will probably cause the death or, or grievous harm to some person, whether the person is the person actually killed or not. Although the knowledge is accompanied by indifference, whether death or grievous bodily harm is caused or not, or by a wish that it may not be caused. C, using violent measures in the commission of or attempt at a of a felony, unquote. The prosecution in their bid to prove the fourth ingredient led evidence that the accused person killed the disease with malice aforethought. Section 190 of the criminal code provides that malice aforethought is deemed to be established when a person has an intention to cause death of or to do grievous harm to a person, whether the person is the person actually killed or not or uses violent measures in the, commission of, in the commission of or attempt at a felony. The cause of death and the intention with which the act or the omission causing the death can be inferred from the nature of the injuries and the weapon used by the accused. In the English case of Haim and DPP 1974A2ALER41, the House of Lords then, House of Lords held, held that an intention to cause death or grievous bodily harm is established if it is proved that the accused deliberately and intentionally did an act that is that it was probable that it would result in the death of the death or grievous harm to the victim even though he did not desire that results lord helsham stated at page 55 that and i quote if a man in full knowledge of the of the danger involved and without lawful excuse deliberately does that which exposes a victim to the risk of the probable grievous bodily harm in the sense explained or death and the victim dies the perpetrator of the crime is guilty of murder and not manslaughter to the same extent as if he had intended the consequences to follow and irrespective of whether he wishes it Unquote. From the above authority, the circumstances of this case clearly shows the intention of the accused person was to cause the death of the disease. Firstly, the accused person began to put his intention into action when he ensured that his residence is empty. He instructed his guards to go on patrol to the beach, and he instructed Lamindur his official driver to take his family members to the residence of Edward Singate on the pretext that there was a party at the residence, at the said residence. Secondly, the evidence of Pa Abib Mumbai shows that he receives information during inf investigation that the accused person blocked the vehicle of the disease at the airport, such that the disease could not leave until the accused person had, accused person and Edward Singate arrived. He also gave evidence that the information he received from he received further stated that even 
when the disease arrived at the car park at the airport to leave, he waited for the accused person to arrive. That when the, ac when the accused person arrived, he joined the vehicle of the disease and they drove away. Thirdly, the accused person in conspiracy with Edward Singate and Peter Singate, BK, BK Jata, Tumbul Tamba, Pa Ali Gomez, and Alajikani used a pistol to hit the disease until he died. The evidence of Alajikani shows that even after the disease fell down, they continued hitting him, and uh, the whole, hitting him, the whole place was full with blood. The accused person, by using a pistol to hit the disease, knew very well that the use of a pistol can cause death or actual bodily harm. It is a fact that a pistol is a lethal weapon used by the accused person to hit the disease with, and the inference that could be drawn from the use of the pistol to beat the disease must be deemed to be to intend the cause to intend to cause grievous bodily harm, and that death would be a probable consequence of the said act. In the Gambia Court of Appeal decision of Abu Bakar Tunkara and the State Criminal Appeal Number. 68 class 2011 unreported where it is held that and I quote, there is no doubt that a person who delivers a violent blow with a weapon on a vulnerable part of the body must be deemed to have intended to cause such bodily injury as he knew that death would be probable consequence of his act, unquote. Fourthly, the accused not only stopped at this participating in hitting the disease with a pistol, but took part in disposing the body of the disease by burning same. Alaji Kanye's evidence shows that the accused person, together with Edward Singater and Peter Singater, left with the dead body of the disease, which was placed in the official vehicle of the disease. The accused person and his co-conspirator conspiracy, thus made the death of the disease to look like an accident. In my view, it was simply to cover up such a horrendous crime by the accused person, Edward Singate and Peter Singate. I must say that these facts only strengthen the intention of the accused person to ensure that the disease was dead by all means necessary. The accused person in his brief contended that the prosecution failed to prove the evidence of the most crucial evidence, the alleged murder weapon. I must say that the absence of the murder weapon is not fatal to the prosecution's case in the absence of comparable evidence on the cause of death. In the Nigerian Supreme Court case of Muhammad Gab Gaba and the State, 2010, 12 NWLRPT, during the trial is, in my view, inconsequential. It, it is the intentional murderous assault on a vital part of the body which leads to conviction. There can be no doubt that a person delivering a violent blow with a stick or club on a vulnerable part of the body, such as the head, must be deemed to have intended the cause, to have it intended to cause such bodily injury as he knew that death would be the consequences, consequences of his act, unquote. From the totality of the evidence adduced by the prosecution, there is sufficient evidence placed before this honorable court to hold the accused person kill the disease with malice aforethought. From the evidence, the actions of the accused and the circumstances of the, of the case shows that the accused had the prescript mental element of intention to cause the death of the disease. I am therefore satisfied that the prosecution has proved the charge of murder beyond reasonable doubt against the accused person, and this I shall hold as a fact. With regards to the fourth and final issue as to whether the accused person properly raised the defense of alibi in this case is worthy of consideration as a possible defense. If so, whether is he entitled to the defense of alibi is a crucial defense. The accused person denied being present at the scene of crime at the time that the disease was killed. In his evidence in chief before this honorable court, the accused person testified that he drove to the airport in the vehicle of, the, of Chairman Jammeh. He test, further testified that from the airport, he joined Chairman Jammeh's vehicle to return 
to the state house with the commander's, with the chairman's driver. He testified that he reached the state house around 12, eight, 12 midnight and had a chat with the state guard commander, Captain Lan Tombon Tamba. In my view, the accused person clearly put up a defense that he was not at the house around 8 towards 9 when the disease was beaten to death by the accused person and his colleagues, including Alaji Kanye, contrary to the prosecution's case. The accused person has raised the defense of alibi in relation to the charges, to the charge. That is the accused person was somewhere else other than where the prosecution say he was at the time of the commission of the offense with which he is charged. In, the, in his book, Practical Approach to Criminal Litigation in Nigeria, revised third edition, 2007, Justice Agaba, at page 62, held as follows, and I quote, where an accused person defends to a criminal allegation is alibi. What, is, what he is saying is that he was at another place where the, when the offense was committed. In fact, it is the practical impossibility if a person or human being present at two different places at the same time that gives the defense its efficacy, provided it is established, unquote. The landed auto continue at page 63 to 64 as follows, and I quote, the defense or plea of alibi must not only be raised, but must be promptly and properly raised by the suspect to warrant any consideration. To start with, it must be mentioned at the, out, at the outset that the relevant time, that the relevant time material to the defense of alibi is the exact time the offense, the offense was committed. Thus, is not a sufficient that the suspect was somewhere else at a time antecedent or consequent, subsequent to the commission of the alleged offense. Rather, he was somewhere else and could not have been present at the scene of the crime. As common as the defense of alibi seems or sound, it is not raised merely by saying I was somewhere else. It must be properly raised. The defense of alibi is said to be properly properly and duly raised only when the defendant not only stated that he was not at the scene of crime but somewhere else but because but goes but also goes further to satisfy the evidential burden on him giving particulars of the other place which he claims to be at the time of the offense was committed this he must do by naming the exact place he was the person he was with or who could testify that he was, at, he was there at the time where an accused person fails to give particulars of the place. He was at the time of the commission of the offense charge. The names of those who were at, with him, if any, and the time they were together, agreeing with the time the offense was committed, he is said not to have properly raised alibi, where he gives conflicting stories as to his whereabouts at the material time, under such consideration, he has, no, he has not properly raised alibi, and there is no obligation on the prosecution to go, into, in, into, to go on investigation. There must, as the burden to disapprove alibi on the prosecution, the defendant on his own part must also discharge what is called the evidential or secondary burden, unquote. On the time to raise the defense of alibi, the landed auto at page 67 said at the time, the time to raise, the right time to raise the plea of alibi is as soon as the suspect is apprehended by the police or other law enforcement agents. In fact, it must, be, it must form part of his statement to the police if he were to make any statement. The reason is that as soon as his plea is raised, and reasonable particulars are given. The police or other law enforcement agents is on the duty to do investigation, to investigate the alibi, to ascertain its truth or falsity, unquote. The prosecution refers this court to the case of, the, the prosecution refers this honorable court to the decision in the case of the state and Abdullah Baji and three others crime case number HC slash 078 slash 1A slash CR slash 012 slash AO. Judgment delivered on the 16th day of December 2020 
by Honorable Justice Sainabu Wada Sisi, unreported, wherein Honorable Justice Sainabu Wada Sisi held as follows, and I quote, it is tried that in raising the defense of alibi, the accused must furnish the police with full details of the alibi at the earliest opportunity to enable the police to check the details. I must quickly emphasize that the burden to prove the guilt of the accused passing lies throughout on the prosecution. The requirement of the accused to provide details of the alibi goes not, does not shift the burden of proof to the accused, but it weakens the defense of alibi. See the case you know, of Suwami and the state. In the instant case, the defense of alibi was raised during trial. This means that the defense was not raised timelessly and was therefore not investigated. It is instructive to note that the first and the third accused persons maintain silence in their cautionary statements about their whereabouts at the time of the attack. The accused persons did not call anyone to their, f or call none of their friends that they say they, are with, they were with and uh, failed to lead further evidence in support of the defense. In Orago and the state, 1992 to NWLR, the court held as follows. It is, not prop it is not proper way of raising a defense of alibi or for an accused to merely show that he was somewhere, somewhere at the time antecedent to the time of the crime was committed. To the time of the crime was proved to have been committed. He must go further to show that because he was at the place at that time, it was impossible for him to prove for him to have been at the scene of the crime when it was shown to have been committed. Emphasis on the line. In support of this principle enunciated in Orago and the state, the court had earlier in Obioda and the state held that the law is that it is not enough for an accused to raise the defense of alibi at large. He must give adequate particulars of his whereabouts at the time of the commission of the offense to assist the police to make a meaningful investigation of the, of the alibi. If the accused person said he was in a particular locality or with a particular passing or persons, he gives a lead as to the specific place, the name and name, the name and or addresses of whom he contacted and the relevant period. He was away from the scene of the crime, unquote. In our instant case, the accused raised the plea of alibi in court, precisely during his examination in chief. I must emphasize that the accused person did not raise the plea of alibi with the police when he was confronted by the police in relation to the allegation contained in the information, you know, in the information in this, in this case. The accused person refused to speak to the police and simply invoked constitutional immunity. That never was. I have looked at Exhibit A, the cautionary statement of the accused person, and made no mention of his whereabouts on the night in question, or thereabout, when the offense was committed. Under the rule of alibi, any accused person setting up alibi as a defense is also duty-bound to give the police at the earliest opportunity some tangible and useful information relating to the place he was and the person with whom he was. He, was, he also was. In our instant case, the accused person, by failing to inform the police at the earliest opportunity when he was arrested, deprived the police of the opportunity to further investigate the alibi to ascertain its truth or falsity. Thus, failure, to, failure of the accused person to raise the plea of alibi timelessly and properly warrants the same to be rejected. The prosecution refers this honorable court to the Supreme Court case of Samson Ebehimi and another versus the state. Supreme Court 220 slash 2008. Judgment delivered on the sixth day of March 2009 and reported 2009. All ALL FWLR PT 486182. And in that case, there was a robbery between 11 p.m. on a particular day and 2 a.m. the next day, in which PW3, 4, and 5 lost various items, including house and car keys. At 5 a.m. of the same day, the first appellant was arrested by a group of youth, and in possession was a hammer and keys. The said keys were later identified to belong to the 
Peter Blue, three, four, and five, that the for Apollon raised the plea of alibi for the first time at his trial, and same was rejected by the trial court. In upholding the lower court's decision that the defense of alibi was rightly rejected by the trial court, the Supreme Court of Nigeria held that for the defense of alibi to be properly raised, it must be raised at the earliest opportunity when an accused is, in con is confronted with the commission of the offense so that the police will be in a position to check the alibi. The Supreme Court concluded that, there, that where the alibi is raised for the first time at the trial court, it does not warrant consideration by the court. In our instant case, the accused by raising the defense of alibi for the first time on trial, it is not worthy of consideration by this honorable court because the accused person has failed to raise the defense of alibi at the earliest opportunity when he was confronted by the police about the allegation contained in the bill of indictment. And this I shall hold as a fact. In view of the fact that the accused person raised the alibi, raised the alibi for the first time during the trial when he opened his defense and after the prosecution has closed his case, the evidential burden was placed on the accused to prove his alibi on the preponderance of probab probability. In the case of Abu Bakr Ibrahim and the state, it was held, and I quote, it, it is possible in some cases for the accused to refuse giving voluntary statement to the police before trial, in which case he will not then raise the alibi. But if at the trial an accused person who never raised an alibi when making his statement to the police or on oath in his defense raised the issue of his not being at locus criminis at the time the offense he is alleged to have committed took place raised a new issue entirely from the alibi. From, for alibi to be a defense raised before trial for the police to investigate so as to decide its veracity. But since, but once before the court on trial, the accused person who raised a defense of his being elsewhere at the time of the offense was being committed, has made an assassin he must prove. I have, unquote, I have also avert, observed that from Exhibit B, the voluntary statement, and that the accused refused to give a, cost, a voluntary statement to the police on the basis of immunity. When, the, when he was arraigned, he did not offer any defense of alibi until he, was open, until he opened his defense. The accused person testified from the airport, testified that from the airport, he drove in the car of the chairman Jame to return to the state house. He also stated that he was alone with the driver of the then chairman, one Pamala. The accused also testified that when he reached the state house between 11 p.m. to 12 a.m., he chatted a little with Lantombong Tamba. On the cross-examination, he acknowledged that both Pamalang pa, pa and Lantombong Tamba are both alive and present in the Gambia. The prosecution posed the question if the accused intend to call the aforementioned as witnesses to his to which he responded in the negative. The accused person did not call the said Pamalang or Lantam Montamba to testify and support his assertion that at the time of the commission of the offense, under consideration, he was at the state house. And, that, and the inference that can be drawn is that the defense of alibi is simply an afterthought. And this I shall hold as a fact. The accused person failed to challenge the evidence of alleged kind that he is in fact that he in fact struck the disease with a stick which resulted in the death of the disease. Therefore, the purported defense of alibi put forward by the accused person should be viewed with the context in this, the strong evidence put forward by the prosecution. In the case of Ochema G, Chema G and the state, Supreme Court Nigeria held that, and I quote, there is nothing extraordinary or extrotic in a plea of alibi. Such a plea postulates that the accused person could not have been at the scene of crime and only inferentially that he was not there. Even if it is not the duty of the prosecution to check on a statement of alibi by an, by an accused person and disapprove the alibi or attempt to do so, there is inflexible and or invariable way of doing this. If the prosecution adduces sufficient and 
acceptable evidence to fix the accused person at the scene of the crime, at the material time. Solely, his alibi is thereby logically and physically demolished, unquote. From the, fore, from the foregoing, I reach the conclusion that the accused has raised, has failed to establish the defense of alibi as required by law. I therefore hold as a fact that the accused person is not entitled to the defense of alibi put forward in this case and is there and is hereby rejected and as it lacks merit and not tenable. I must state that I believe the testimonies of Alaji Kani and Samendi, Hamad Jangam, Lamin Dur, Pahabib Mbai, and Muhammad Lamin, Muhammad LK Bojan, depicting the true picture of how Usman Koro Sisi was murdered in cold blood. And I must emphasize that the law does not concern itself with trifle, as stated in the progeny of the Latin maxim, the minimis non curat lex. I have no cogent reason to disbelieve the testimonies of the prosecution witnesses because defense witnesses themselves admitted that there was no reason for the prosecution witnesses to lie against the accused person. I have had the opportunity to watch the accused person, our Minty, Mami Minty, closely when they were giving evidence. I must say that their demeanors were not convincing at all, and I am not persuaded by it. As Mami Minty and our Minty admitted on the cross-examination that they would do anything possible to make the accused person happy and protect him. In my view, these admissions on cross-examination leave much to be desired. I am therefore satisfied that the prosecution has sufficiently established the constituent elements of the offense as charged. I am further satisfied that the prosecution has proved their case beyond reasonable doubt and the accused person, Yang Kubaturi, is accordingly found guilty and convicted as charged. You are reminded of your right to appeal against this conviction. So, prosecution? Any previous conviction known? No. Defense counsel, yes, do you have any plea in mitigation? Prosecution. You want to say a few words? Very counsel, yes, let me hear what you are saying. That is not you want to say a few words? Yes, if you want to say, okay, if you want to say anything. Yes. I am not getting you clearly. I mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. The law is very clear. 
So, under the circumstances, considering the time, I think I will have to adjourn this matter for a sentence. Oh, you want to adjourn the sentence? Yes. I don't think we find a sentence without the answer because we are finished. Yes, yes. We'll be sent. Yes. Mm. Yes. Mm. Yes. Yes. I think the matter is still pending before the Supreme Court. The matter is concluded. So it's, it's pending there. Yeah, but it's a, it's a matter before the Supreme Court. So prosecution. So what I'm saying, do I proceed with the sentence or we take an adjournment for the sentence? Yes, I was suggesting to take an adjournment for the sentence. Okay, so so let me let me let me prepare the sentence then. Hmm? Recording in progress.
Sentence. Having found the convict guilty of murder, guilty of mo the murder of Usman Koro Sise in cold blood, and having considered that this court does not have any discretion under section 188 of the criminal court, the convict Yankuba Ture is hereby sentenced to death. And uh, pass one to section 252 of the criminal procedure court, the said sentence of death shall be by hanging. So this court will rise. Very well, um, we are here at the High Court in Banjul where Justice Ibrahim Ajayde has found former AFPRC junta member Mr. Yankuba Ture guilty of murdering Usman Koro Sise. Just moments ago, he handed over his sentencing. He sentenced him to death, and this death should come by hanging. That is the big development here at the High Court. Mr. Ture is over there speaking to uh, his lawyer there, Abdullahi Sisoho, that's been heavy police presence here. So we will, Mr. Ture, do you have any comment? Not over. Careful. Mr. Ture, do you have a comment? His lawyer is over there. Let's try to speak to him. Uh, Mr. Uh, Barista, Barista, good afternoon. Barista, do you have a comment? Do you have a word? That is uh, Mr. Ture's lawyer there. Do you have a comment, sir? Sir, you don't have a comment. What is your view on the outcome of this case? You don't have a comment, sir? We're going to file an appeal. Simply sit I will talk to my client. Hopefully, in the We'll file an appeal. You will file an appeal. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. So he is saying that they will file an appeal uh, there. So the big, big development there, that is uh, Abdullah Sisoho, the lawyer to Mr. Yankuba Ture. So that is the development there. The breaking news there is that Mr. Yankuba Ture has been found guilty of killing former Gambian finance minister, Usman Koro. Uh, Cise. It took more than two hours for this development to, to come at exactly 3 p.m. here in the Gambia. Justice Ibrahim Ajayte uh, found Mr. Mr. Ture guilty of uh, murdering Kuro Cise uh, there. So that is the development. The session is over now. This judgment was delivered across over two hours so this is uh, it's been a lot of it's been a lot of people here who have come mr ture has been whisked away so the lawyer is telling me his lawyer bly is saying that so these are some of the people who came he is insulting, we will not take that. Because <laughs> 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 
you because I like the of our young. That is some of the people. Uh, Ibrahim Jadi is a liar. They're all the same people. They're, you, you, you mean the judge? They're the one who killed Kolosise. It's not Yankubo Ture. Yankubo Ture has nothing to do with Kolosise's death. He will be free. My father was, my father, in Jehovah's days, my father, Alain Tumani Minter, was sentenced to death. But he was free. The call of Epi. Yes. Ibrahim Jete is a liar. So you are saying the judge is a liar? He's a liar. He's a judge. He's a liar. Why are you insulting the judge? No, but he's telling the truth. There's no truth in it. He's one-sided. What are you going to do? What are we going to do? We live in Almighty Allah. What are you to Yankuba Ture? What are you to Mr. Ture? I'm his brother. So that is a brother there. So you you are also not happy? I'm not happy at all. I'm not happy. And this will not happen in the Gambia. It will never happen in the Gambia. And if, if this thing will happen in the Gambia, the whole the whole Gambia will be there. Nobody can see this. No. We don't. Hey. So those are the reactions from some of the people that are here. Justice, <laughs> Lumo Lumo Wahe Lumo Ride his ruling Mungla Wanella Mungla Wanella Sumaya who gives me the Kuko. I've been following this court. Kola is Hamne, this part of the organized conspiracy and campaign against Yajami and APRC. We have Mwene, so they get a justice that tell Mwene. I was singing at it. I was singing at it. Momila have no more the author of all this nonsense. Huh? The, the main guy behind this. You in back of the IRC. You have no idea. How many is a murderer? You back of the IRC. What's that? So it's a guy by Pasti. So you don't yell, they don't yell, they don't yell, you 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 don't yell, and you know it was a state protest outside the terror sea. Why are you going to go to the race again? So, Mungla, when you're a big guy, young man, it's becoming lawlessness. They're going to go to the And you know that, my brother. They're going to go to the dollar. So, 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 they're going to go to the dollar. Yes, we're going to appeal. The Amgen confidence in us will appeal to the appeal to the end of the Of course. Because we're going to say, you have to say, Allah is the king. Allah is the king. Allah is the king. You are not alone. 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 Because you're not the RNC. Like no, it's a conspiracy. Like yes, it's a conspiracy. So, young, young people is being used as a scapegoat? Of course. Yeah, of course. I don't see that. Mom, you have the testimony of Allah is Kanji is credible. The Allah is Kanji, you can't implicate. I don't see that. You can't implicate. I don't see that. So, I don't see that. He's the author of the death of Kurosisi. Uh, He's the main guy behind this. Then come because I don't like what I need to do. But we are not. Huh? Of course.